Good morning. You got your coffee. Where's my coffee? Oh, really? Is that my coffee? Excuse me. Excuse me. We are live. We are live. But Bruce and Jane, do you know how Bruce and Jane are? Their car broke down. Like Bruce and Jane, thank you so much for getting me a coffee. But their car broke down, and I don't know where they are at the moment. <laughs> but uh, the important thing happened, whoever retrieved the coffee, thank you. Yes and amen. <laughs> this morning, Seal, can you put that picture up? This morning, I want to talk about, you know, as we're entering into our Christmas season. Who likes Christmas? Who likes Christmas? I, I have a confession to make. I love Christmas. I love Christmas, but I don't know sometimes if the build up to Christmas is better than Christmas Day. The anticipation, the wrapping, the, the wrapping that Seal does, uh, and the buying the gifts that Seal does, and uh, all the work that Seal does, and the cooking, and Andrew, the food, the food. You can't have Christmas Day. Mike, the food, the food that happens. And you know you have to, you have to uh, pace yourself on Christmas Day because you can't eat too much early when you know you've got a lovely Christmas dinner coming up. Getting together with family and rejoicing. And so this morning, throughout this month, next week we're going to do a bit of a forum again um, online and, and our topic's going to be, is Christmas still relevant today? And then the week after when we're back in the hall, um, uh, it's going to be my Christmas message called the first, well, it's not called the first Noel, it's called... Actually, I don't know, Mike, another one of those titles. I think at this stage I've titled it The First Noel. Or as we say in Australia, The First Noel. Noel. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hallelujah. But as you can see there, you got a friend in me. You got a friend in me. Anyone who's had Toy Story, it's about all I know and can remember. Let's stand this morning. Can I have my guitar on, please? Am I that you are mindful of me? this morning that you call us friend. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, for your love, for your grace and your mercy. And as we come before you, Lord, as we come before you in the word this morning, we just pray, Holy Spirit, for just an open heaven as the atmosphere of you, Lord, as the anointing of you just floods over our soul, that revelation would come into our spirit, Lord. We rejoice in you this morning and praise your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Andrew, would you mind just bringing, oh, bringing this to the side, please? Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, friends are so important. And Christmas time, well, 
You have family and you have friends. And as they say, you cannot choose your family, but you can choose your friends. You can choose your friends. And they say that there's four levels and types of friendships that we have. And uh, acquaintances, everyone has acquaintances. People that we see perhaps on a regular basis that we sort of know. And I think a lot of us have a lot of acquaintances, especially in our work and the things that we do. We have a lot of acquaintances. We have casual friends. Casual friends are typically those that you might spend time with, shared activities, you cross paths with, perhaps casual friends from school, again, perhaps from work where you're mixing in and meeting people in different areas. Um, You have, of course, then close friends. And close friends pretty well start off as acquaintances. They move up to casual friends. Depending how they are, they may get bumped back out of the close friends, casual friends, back to the acquaintance circle, depending on what they do. Depends how much bacon they bring, Mike. And so they can move up from acquaintances to casual friends to close friends. And then things that happen in life, and yeah, sometimes it moves. And then from close friends, we have intimate friends. And apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, who is my best friend, my nextest bestest friend is my wife. She is my nextest, bestest, bestest friend. You got a friend in me. (laughs) Intimate friends are most, you know, the most intensely connected friends that you let into the inner part of your life where you reveal your heart and your mind, the ones who you trust with the deepest secrets and you know who will never let you down. You know those people will never let you down and and some people form this type of friendships with their, their wife or their husband, with their family, but that's not always the case. Uh, It can be all different things. And so friendship is one of those funny things, as I said, where you can go from one place to the other. And depending if you've got a fail stamp at home or not, people can go, close friend, fail stamp, you've been bumped. And depending on how bad they can, you can go, did you know you can go from intimate friends straight down to acquaintance in one move, one move. You can go from here to here and you're out the door. Straight out the door, and, and you know, Christmas can have a way of doing that uh, with everything that goes on. The pressures of Christmas. Do you like Christmas? Yeah. I have to say, I, I do like. I did like a cold Christmas, Mike and Nadine. I, I, well, cold Christmas in Europe was lovely. It was lovely, um, even though my whole life growing up here in Australia, it's maybe nothing but a hot Christmas. Um, I'm still not used to it. I still like the cold, but. Christmas is season that we have, and in this Christmas season where we're meeting together with friends and we're meeting together with family, we've got work breakup parties, we've got family breakup Christmas dues. We had one on Friday night. Sorry, Peter, that's why I couldn't go to the coffee, and I double booked. We had a family; they were they were in our close friends category, people that I've grew up in church with that we've known for over thirty years, and uh, we got together. And for one of the couples, uh, for Seal, she's known her since she was a little girl. And so we've stayed friends, and so we had our break up there. And, you know, they say that Oxford University has said that they do this crazy mathematical thing, which I'm someone like Morgana would understand, because they measure the size of the neocortex, the part of the brain responsible for sensory perception, as well as processing language and emotion. Dr. Google told me that, so I'm just going to have to take their word from it. Um, so that controls the part of the brain. And in this working out that they did, they say that people generally deal with about 150 friendships across. And typically we have a core group of five very close friends or intimate friends. And uh, then we have a cluster of about 10 close friends. And then we have, as it grows out, the increases from casual friends to acquaintances. But in this season of Christmas, in this season of meeting people, what kind of friend are you? And what kind of friends do you surround yourself with that speak into your life? And I wanted to look at two aspects this morning as we do that. Because you are, you are and can be the greatest testimony, the greatest gospel message that someone would ever meet in their life. You could be the greatest gospel message that someone sitting next to you on a bus, someone sitting next to you on a train, someone sitting next to you in an office, someone that you're walking along with, someone who you may, a total stranger that God may say, go and talk to them, have a coffee with them. You could be the greatest gospel message that they would ever encounter. What kind of friends do we have? The thing about friendship is, and the thing about being a friend and showing a friend, showing friendship is, you don't need to know them first. You can just go up, hey, how are you? 
I was waiting for a response. How are you? How's your day? Being, enjoying being in a church? Oh, awesome. See, things can just start and you pick up and you start to do that. And, and I, I know that the testimony that we carry of Jesus Christ within us is something that, you know, he, God desires for us to share. I am a friend of God. I'm a friend of God in all that we do. And so I wanted to look quickly at the life of King David. I'm not going to turn to the scriptures yet. But in King David's life, and we read about him in 1 Samuel, that David had numerous people. And David had his mighty men. He had the 30, and from the 30, he had the three. And then apart from the three, he still had others. But these mighty men that he had were men who went out and did amazing feats for him. One of my favourite, I think it's, um, oh, I may not get his name right, was it Abishai, who stood in the lentil field. The friend that stood in the lentil field. The friend that said, I heard a message about this one time. And a, a man who decided to stand his ground, protecting a field that was worthless. It was nothing but lentils. Lentils. And it showed me the, 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 when we stand firm in the things of God, even when it seems like nothing, greatness can flow out of that. And so he, David had his mighty men, but apart from the mighty men that he fought with, are you imagine being in the cave of Adullam? And you're sitting there and the king says to you, oh, that I could drink from the waters, that I could taste and have a drink of the waters. And so three good friends tried to go out. So Mike, Andrew and Peter said, you know what, let's go out for Harry and let's go get. And so they race out and they sneak out. They go into the enemy's camp and they get a cup of water. Well, it must have been close. And they're running back and they say, here you are, Harry. And I often look at that picture when David does this. And then he says, oh, how could I drink from this? And then he tips it out. I don't know, my brain would have gone, what? <laughs> Do you know how hard it was to get that water? But there was more going on, of course. There's the people that he surrounded. But apart from these guys, I, I want to focus on a few people that had an input into David's life. One of them being Samuel. So David, but before we get to Samuel, David, when we look at David's life, we know that he was the shepherd boy that became king. We know that he was the boy who had to deal with King Saul trying to kill him. We know he was the boy that had the promise upon his life and he's there brought into the presence of the king and all this tension that's going on in the king's family and everything like that. But when you look at the scriptures and you read about David, that we can see that David says in, verse, in Psalm 69, he says, Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They are mighty who would destroy me. Bring my enemies wrongfully, though I have stolen nothing. I must restore it. O oh God, you know my foolishness and my sins are not hidden from you. Let not those who wait for you, O Lord of hosts, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed of me. Let not those who seek you be confounded of me, O God of Israel, because for your sake I have borne reproach. Shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children. In Psalm 51, David writes in the aftermath of his affair with Bathsheba, he writes this down and in verse five of Psalm 51. He says, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin, my mother conceived me. And when you look at the life of David and study the life of David, it said that he was an illegitimate child. Either his father or his mother, they think it was more that his, his mother had an affair. Uh, they're not quite sure which one, but they say that he was a half son. And so that's why when Samuel, when you read in Samuel there, where Samuel came to the town, it said that they were trembling with fear. And when they were trembling with fear, they knew they had to get everything right because the Samuel, the prophet, hey, Hey, good, Eve, good morning. Welcome. Thank you, Bruce and Jane. You are a blessing to us. Thank you so much. You're a blessing, Bruce and Jane. <laughs> and uh, the coffee does taste nice for those watching online. Oh. And so Sam, David is there and it says that Samuel is there, sorry, and he goes to anoint the family. And he goes to anoint them and he goes through, as we know the story, and it says that, is there no one left? And so in Jewish writings, it's said that David was, con was considered to be an illegitimate child. And because he was an illegitimate child, he was left out there. The thing I love about Jesus and the genealogy of Jesus is that he makes mention, that he makes sure, God made sure 
that Rahab was mentioned in the genealogy. God makes sure that Naomi was mentioned. He makes sure that Ruth, sorry, is mentioned. He makes sure that what was not, shouldn't have been there, was placed in the line of Jesus. And here we have David, the King David, who is supposed to be with the sons, but he's out in the field. And so they bring him in. And so he writes that in Psalm 51, I was born forth of iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. He didn't get on with his brothers. His brothers didn't like him because he wasn't a full brother. And so he was cast aside and any wonder when he went up to war and they're facing Goliath that his brothers would turn to him and say, what are you doing here? And the scriptures show us the tension. In the, so David wasn't just a life where I'm just this shepherd boy playing the harp or playing the harp, I suppose, playing the harp not like this, playing the harp and doing all the things out in the field with the sheep and telling the sheep everything. Um, it wasn't just a simple life. He grew up in a place of tension. He grew up in a place where things were coming against him and yet God in his wisdom looked down and saw the heart of David. What a promise for us. He looked down, if you've been in a family that's broken, if you've been in a place where you feel it illegitimate, if you've been in a place where you feel you're just not connecting with things, God has a promise he has a future. You are a friend of God. You're a friend of God. So we know David becomes and he gets anointed king. And so the story continues where David comes through, he becomes king of Judah, and then later on becomes king of a united Judah and Israel. There are three people that had an impact in David's life. And the first one I want to look at is Samuel. And we see that in 1 Samuel 16. Samuel called David. He anointed David for the Lord. He supported David. He protected David. He positioned David to be the harpist for King Saul. The strange thing is when you look at the Scriptures, he's there as a harpist for King Saul, yet later on, Saul didn't even recognise him when David went to fight Goliath. He said, who's is this? Whose son is this? Whose boy is this? He didn't understand who where David was and where he was from. That David had a friend in Samuel. That Samuel believed in him. Samuel believed it wasn't his first choice. And you know what's even encouraging about David? He was the eighth choice. You ever stood in line in those sports games and all the good people who were in sport, like Andrew, get picked first? I want Andrew. I want Andrew. I want that Andrew. I want that Andrew. And Morgana, you know, they always get picked first. And then the ones who are, and the ones who are, no, I believe you, Morgana. That's right. <laughs> and then the ones who aren't so good, they're the ones shuffling. Go, oh, actually, you know, if we were playing golf, Colin would be my first pick. Colin would be my first pick if we were playing golf. And so David was eighth. He was eighth in line. And he gets anointed and the kingship comes upon him. And as he's surrounded in this place of being a king, he decides to surround himself with good friends. Samuel is one of those friends, speaks into his life and imparts into his life, speaks promise into his life, tells him what God is in place for him and says, this is there for you. We all need Samuels in our life. We need Samuels that will build us up, that will tell us that we're on the right path, that we're moving forward, that we're doing well. The friend that sees past the roughness of the outer exterior and sees beyond to what's inside. Like Paul speaking into the life of Timothy, I would imagine, a similar thing. Another friend that David has was Jonathan. And we know the story of David and Jonathan. Uh, the sad part in that story, as it happens with friends, that uh, you can see in the scriptures, which I'm not going to get into now, that, that it ended really tragically in that place, not because of Jonathan's death, but you can actually see in the scriptures the jealousy from Jonathan, that Jonathan became someone who was so obsessed and his ploy in trying to get and be friends with David wasn't just a friendship, but there was also an aspect of if I can't become king through my father, perhaps I can get power through my brother. And so Jonathan was very shrewd in what he did. But there was a genuine friendship there and David talked about that. He talked about the anguish and the closeness with him. But Jonathan was a friend. Jonathan was a friend who protected him. Jonathan protected David from his own father. He set things up that David was protected even when the king's word said, you will go out and kill David. Jonathan disobeyed the king because of his friendship and his love for David. And we need friends like that. 
We need friends that will protect us from that. Friends that protect us from things that are going on around us. Friends that will say and stand in the gap. Like brothers, as you said, if you take on me, if you're going to take on me, you're going to have to take on all my brothers. Thankfully, one of my brothers looks pretty rough. <laughs> so they look at me and they go, oh, that's no problems. But uh, then I say, actually, it's quite funny because it's, uh, my youngest brother and I probably look a bit more alike. But the middle brother, people don't often believe we're brothers. That he's an awesome boy. Well, he's in his 40s and not a boy anymore. <laughs> um, Jonathan and David were connected. They exchanged robes, and he, David had on the robe of a prince for the robe of a soldier. He would exchange his weapons with David. He would exchange them. So there was more than just a friendship. There was a closeness in this that would say, I will protect you. I will cover you. I will do what I need to do as your friend, as your brother. And we need people like that in our lives that would cover us like that. Now, another third person who David had in his life, who David would have, perhaps if he had Toy Story back then, would have gone, you got a friend in me? Yeah, right. But these friends are just as important. And this friend is Nathan. That the prophet Nathan in 2 Samuel 12, when David was in a complacent of contentment, complacency, and the Bible tells us that when all kings went to war, David stayed home. David made the mistake of not doing what he was supposed to do. He made the mistake of going onto the rooftop. He made the mistake of looking out upon the rooftop. He made the mistake of not only looking out at Bathsheba, he made the mistake of having a second look. And once he'd made that second look, he made the mistake of letting sin fester into his heart. And of course, we know what happened from there and he sleeps with Bathsheba. You know, the tragedy of this story with David and Bathsheba is that Uriah was one of his friends. Uriah's house was next to David and the king would surround himself by his friends and their friends' houses would be around him. And such was the closeness of what was formed in this friendship that later on, when you read the story of um, David and Absalom, when Absalom sins, uh, Absalom tries to take the kingdom from David and Absalom comes through and there's a guy there who I know I'm not going to pronounce his right, Ahithophel. Ahithophel, Ahithophel. <laughs> Spelling it's easier than saying it. Ahithophel. And so this guy is the one that says to Absalom, you know what you need to do, Absalom? To show your father and to teach him a lesson, you go onto the roof and sleep with the concubines in front of all Israel. And history show, tells us that Ahithophel was either Bathsheba's father or grandfather, more likely her grandfather. And he'd waited all that time to seek vengeance on David in the house of David. See, friendships, when they turn nasty, things can happen. And it can last through into generations. So David had someone like Nathan that come in. Nathan was the guy, as I said, the one we do not want to have, but he's actually the, probably the one we need the most. Nathan comes to David and tells him a story, and he tells David a story of iniquity, and he sets David up, I should say, in his iniquity. Nathan comes to David and tells him the hard truth of what the Lord is saying. Nathan comes to David and he gives him a word of rebuke. Nathan is the friend we all need, but we don't always want. Samuels we like because they always tell us, you're doing great. You're doing great. We love the Samuels. We love the prophets to come and tell us, here is a word for you, thus says the Lord. We like Jonathans because the Jonathans are going to stand with us and say, I got your back. I got your back. I believe in you too. And no matter what did they say about you, I'm not going to let them say that about you. We love the Samuels and Jonathans, but the Nathans, the Nathans are the ones we need, but they're the ones we don't like because they're going to come and tell you, what are you doing? What are you doing? Where is your life at? Why are you allowing this iniquity to creep into your heart, David? Why are you allowing this to happen? But we see, of course, in that story, the goodness of God. We all need a friend that's close enough to tell us where we're wrong. We all need a friend to tell us we're wrong, to let us know when we're stepping over the line when we're becoming more sin conscious rather than righteousness conscious. I have that friend. My wife is not shy in that. <laughs> <laughs> and I absolutely value her for it. I don't like it all the time. I don't like it a 
lot of the time. But I need that. I need the honesty of a friend that would say, what was that? What did you think of that? No, nah, not that good. <laughs> we need a friend to tell us why our idea is wrong. And I was listening to a pastor in New Zealand. He runs a successful church there, and he said this. He said, one of the first things he learned as a pastor and leader was to not surround himself with yes men. But he decided to, if he really wanted to move forward in his leadership, he wanted to surround himself that people would challenge him and say, and he said to them, I need you to tell me why my idea is a bad idea. And he says, it's not that he did it or listened to them all the time, but he needed to challenge his thinking and challenge and say, well, this is what I think God is saying. Really? Why do you think God is saying that? Did you consider this or this or this? No, no, I didn't consider this. Because so often when we move forward in our lives, we become so tunnel visioned in everything we do. And it takes a friend like Nathan that can say something. Of course, they can say it in love. But nevertheless, in love or out of love, truth sometimes really stings. It really hurts. See, God never made us to be on our own. He made us to be connected with brothers and sisters. We all need that friend, as I said, who will challenge us to bring out our best. To bring out our best. We all need sandpaper friends. You got that friend? Oh, they're dear and they're lovely, but it's like every time they open their mouth, it's just, ah. <laughs> yes, 120 grit. We all have those friends, but we need it. We need that friend. We need the friend to help us find the strength in God and grow in our faith. We all, have, we all need to have a friend to tell us the truth when we don't want to hear it. You got a friend in me. You got a friend in me, as Randy Newman said. When the road looks rough ahead and you're miles and miles from your nice warm bed, you just remember that your old pal said, boy, you got a friend in me. Yes. Let's turn your Bibles to John chapter 15. See, in this Christmas season when we're meeting people all the time, encountering people, especially at the shops, and you go there and they're under pressure and things happen. Did you know that a nice word, a friendly word, a friendly smile can just change someone's countenance? It can just change their countenance. And it can help someone who may be having an absolutely ter uh, terrible day turn into a terrific day because someone stopped and said to them, hey, I just want to let you know, you're really doing a great job. I was with Pastor Eugene this week, um, met with him and had a coffee with him. He said, how's the church? I said, oh, they're fabulous. And I was telling him and I was boasting about all you guys. I was boasting. I was bragging to him about all you guys especially now Bruce, because he came in a broken down car and still managed to get me coffee. <laughs> but I was telling him how wonderful you are. I said, oh, G I said, Eugene, I said, the church is just, the language of the church is great. I said, the people are just so amazing. I said, you guys are amazing. You really are amazing. You really should give yourself a pat on the backs. Uh, the friendship that's there, the warmth that's there, the thoughtfulness that's there, in the midst of everything that's gone on, I think Momentum Church has moved forward. It has moved forward in the midst of everything. And I can only put it down to God and you guys. You guys have been amazing. And I love to boast about our church. I love to brag about our church, how amazing it is. And I don't care if others are thinking, oh, it's a tough season, it's really hard, it's been difficult in COVID. I've been the opposite. I've gone, praise the Lord. God is good. He has provided for us. He's made a way. He's done something. The testimony that flows out of my mouth is way better than, oh, wow. Do you know that, Bruce? Yeah, oh, Bruce is done. Oh. You know, friendship is such an amazing thing. We all need more friends. So we see this thing of friends coming onto us and people we surround ourselves with. Now let's look at, as a friend, how are we to be? And the greatest example, of course, is Jesus. In John chapter 15, <clears throat> Jesus is coming through, he's talking to the disciples, tells them that he is the true vine, and he talks about the pruning that goes on. He says that he is the vine, you are the branches, and bearing fruit. And when it gets to verse 9, we read, As the Father loved me, 
I also have loved you. Abide in my love. Now the words he's using there is agape and agapeo. He's using a noun and a verb. He's saying, and when you read, I haven't got it on here, but if you read the, um, I, I do look at the Message Bible sometimes. I do not study from the Message Bible. It's probably one of the worst translations to study from. But it does give a great description sometimes of what, you want to say. And when you look at this, it's saying that um, as the Father loved me, as this love came, this action of God came down into here, Jesus is saying, I also have loved you. And Jesus describes this picture of love. He says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So let me just back up and say, as the Father, agapeo, the verb of it, Love me, I has also, a same thing, the verb of love, love you. Abide in my, now it's the descriptive, it's the noun. Abide in my love. When we get to verse 11, these things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love the verb. It's not just a description, it's doing. That you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love, now he's becoming more descriptive, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. And he calls that friends, and that word even in friends is philos, from the love. And he starts to speak that. Greater love than this that lays down his life. Would you lay down your life for your friend? You know, I actually think people, generally speaking, in a certain situations, they would. They would lay down their lives for their friends. Except if they've bumped from intimate friends down to acquaintances. Then you're out of luck. You are my friends if you do, in verse 14. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants. For a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that fruit should remain, that whatever you ask of my Father in the name, in my name, he will may give you. And these things commanded you that you love one another. Jesus says, I no longer call you servants. The, the literal word doulos there is the word slaves. I'm no longer gonna call you a slave. I'm no longer calling you a slave. I'm elevating you and I'm now gonna call you friends. And Why? Because a slave is not to know what a father, what, what's going to happen in the plans. But a friend will know. And the promise, I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. The Bible speaks of a few people, Noah, Abraham, and Moses. See, friendship is a choice. And we can choose or not choose to be someone's friend. Sometimes we choose not to be someone's friend but just through sheer connection together, you eventually become friends. You ever had a friend who at first you really did not like? <laughs> Thank you. Very nice. It's, yeah, I, I've seen people, you, you ever had a friend you didn't like? Someone you met, you didn't like them, and then because of connecting and connecting and connecting, you realise, hey, they're not actually as bad as I thought, and a friendship comes about. Friendship is a choice. And so Jesus is showing us choice in here. He said, I chose you. I chose you. Noah, Abraham and Moses were called friends of God and the word of God. It was in a response to the call of God, a response to the word of God that Noah built an ark. Abraham left his hometown of Ur and Moses returned to Egypt after being out in the wilderness for 40 years. That there is a correlation between a friend of God and Jesus makes it clear. This isn't just anyone who can say, well, I'm a friend of God. He says, if you love me, you'll obey me. If you love me, you will follow me. If you do what I say, you will and obey my commandments, I will no longer call you slave, but I will call you friend. That there's a price in this. And he starts to show that there is a gift in this because he says no one greater love has no greater love no one has a greater love than this and to lay down one's life for his friends. He chose them. He chose the ones he shouldn't have chosen to be his friends. He chose the ones who should never have made it to the status of being around Jesus. There were 
thousands of people who would have been around there, who have wanted to be his friends and get into that place. But so often Jesus said, well, you're only here because you want a free lunch. But there were 12 that he had close. There were, from the 12, there were three that he kept even closer. And it shows us that that we do. And you know what? Life has a way where you become really close with people, but then life changes. And all of a sudden, close friends go down to friends. And you meet new friends who eventually become close friends. It's life. It happens in that. There is also a fruit in friendship. He said, you do not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. He shows this in the preceding passages when he talks about producing fruit on the grapevines. And so Jesus is the friend that encourages us in our walk. Jesus is the friend that helps us to keep going when it gets hard. Jesus is the friend that reveals our sin, yet loves us all the way through. Have you got a friend in him? Have you got a friend in him? Do you know this Jesus? Is he your friend? Or is he an acquaintance? Or is he an intimate friend? Do we allow him to be the friend of intimacy, that friend of intimacy that will say, hey, hey, what's going on here? We need to shift these things. So I think in this seasons today, in the world today, it's so refreshing to go around and meet happy people. I'd rather meet a happy person than an angry person. I'd rather meet someone who is smiling and wonderful, who has a good joke or two, and coffee, of course. Thank you, Jane. Bacon. <clears throat> but I wanted to share this message because I wanted to remind everyone through this holiday season, what kind of friend are you? Are you a Samuel? Are you a Jonathan? Or are you a Nathan? A lot of people like being the Nathan. <laughs> that can happen. A lot of people like being the Nathan. Oh, I'll tell you what's wrong with you. I'll tell you. <laughs> Have you got a couple of hours? <laughs> I'll tell you what you need to know. But we need more than that. We need that balance that we can have people. So how do we speak into people's lives? And, and I'm, I'm so conscious that in things that go on in our lives today, it's better to speak out of love. Everything to speak out of love. When you identify an issue, when you identify a problem, especially with family, close friends, when you identify the problem, you can't be the Nathan. Now, Nathan was doing what the word of the Lord said. But you can speak that word in love. And in love means, even though I've identified the problem, I'm not going to speak from that position of the problem. I'm going to speak from the position of, how does God want to restore this? How does God want to bring love into this situation? And being able to speak it in love so that love never fails. That love, we know, covers a multitude of sins and love never fails. Love comes in and will say, hey, sweetie, darling, sugar pie, <laughs> you know when you did this the other day, See, that's already you're on the wrong track. You're on the wrong track. I'm already on the wrong track because I've str I'm coming from that position of you have done me wrong. You have done me wrong and I want to identify that and push that back at you. Instead of a friend and going, Lord, great are you that is in me. Help me to deal with this. Okay, Samuel, well, the first thing I'm doing is I'm going to cut away that attitude of yours. And I cut away that attitude of yours so you can see it from a different perspective. And now I can go, oh, that's why this happened. Learning to do this. And God will open an amazing amount of doors when we learn to be friendly. When we learn to say, hey, Lord, help me to be a Samuel, a Jonathan. And if necessary, if necessary, a Nathan. Speaking your words of life. That you can turn around to people and say, did you know that greater love is this? The word says that greater love has no one than this, that he lays down his life for a friend. And you know that God told me that he is my friend, that I'm his friend. 
God didn't just say, I'm a slave. I am no longer a slave. I am no longer working under an obligation. That because of the blood of Jesus, I am now free. I am redeemed. And he's lifted me up in my relationship with him that I am a friend. And because I'm a friend, God will tell me his plans. Because I'm a friend, God will share with me. Because I'm a friend, God will talk to me. Because I'm a friend, he invites me over. And we have a lot of food. Digging in this word. What friend are you going to be today? What friend are you going to be through this season? So, when that family member you've been dreading to see says something to you at Christmas season and you've got the family gathering and that family member is there, think of these words. You got a friend in me. You got a friend in me. And let that song just race through your head. No, I'm lost. <laughs> I'm lost. Let's stand this morning. It's the holiday season. It's Christmas. The Christmas season coming up. Well, in it. Christmas time. Aaron's got a Christmas shirt on. God is good. It's the season to be happy and joyous, to rejoice in God, in his goodness and all that he does to tell all around of his amazing love, to tell everyone, he is my friend, Lord, Saviour, Redeemer, the love of my life, the delight of my life. He is the one that encourages me and lifts me up. He's the one that when I'm feeling down, he picks me up and he places me. He's the one that holds me in and hems me in. He's the one that speaks into me and whispers into me. He is the one that can change my attitude in an instant. He is the one that can do all this and more because he is my friend. Lord, I love you. Father, I thank you this morning. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that we're able to talk and share and open your word. And I pray this morning that for those perhaps listening online would hear this message and say, I need a friend like that. I need a friend like Jesus. And this morning I want to ask you, all it takes is reach out, speak the name of Jesus, open your heart and allow him to come into your heart and receive him this morning. Hallelujah. Father, I speak your blessing on everyone this morning. I speak your covering upon everyone. I just speak, Lord, your favor, your hand, your friendship, your love upon us all as we go throughout this week. In the things of you, we say yes and amen. Amen. Be blessed, church. Have a great week. Don't forget coffee and tea are on. And Bruce, again, thank you.